Hey, welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. So we now know that Ryzen 5 is just around the corner. And even so, although it's only a few weeks away, I just couldn't wait. And we took a sneak peek at the gaming performance by running a few simulated tests. And this was done by disabling a few cores on the Ryzen 7 processors. I do expect the simulated performance to be pretty much spot on with what we will see from Ryzen 5 in a few weeks time. And really that is great news because things looked very good. The Ryzen 5 simulated performance video came about because a week prior a heap of you asked me to play around with the down core feature and mimic the core configurations of the 6 core and 4 core models. And it wasn't because just 24 hours earlier before my video Linus released the same kind of test looking at simulated Ryzen 5 performance. Uh, the testing for my video alone took an entire two days. Anyway, in the event that Linus beats me once again by looking at the impact CCX latency has on performance, please know I'm not copying him. Testing for this video began on the 22nd of March, I promise. Once again, I decided to make this video because so many of you requested it. So what exactly are we going to be testing? Well, actually, before we get to that, for those of you who don't know, here is a quick explanation of how Ryzen CPUs are designed. Ryzen 7 features 8 cores in total, and with the addition of Simultaneous Multi-Threading, or SMT for short, there are 16 threads on offer. However, not all 8 cores are located within the same die. Rather, they are spread across two modules, or CPU complexes, as AMD calls them. The CPU complexes, or CCX for short, are connected using an interface called Infinity Fabric, but we won't cover that in detail here. Let's focus on the core configuration. Ryzen 7 and the upcoming Ryzen 5 processors feature two CCX modules, which means to a degree half the cores are separated, and as a result for them to work together means there will likely be a performance penalty. In contrast, Intel's 10-core desktop CPUs work within a single die. The Broadwell E architecture stacks the cores around a shared level 3 cache. The fully enabled silicon offers 10 cores, and this is how the 6950X is configured. The 6900K features two cores disabled, while the 6800K has four cores disabled. Typically, processors with defective cores get binned as lower end parts, so what would have been a 10 core 6950X becomes an 8 core 6900K or a 6 core 6800K. So what's key to note here is that latency between any core is the same. Moving back to Ryzen, it has been discovered that the latency penalty uh, between cores of different CCXs is over twice that of cores within the same CCX. So basically for cores to communicate within the same CCX, you're looking at around a 40 nanosecond delay. Meanwhile, when going between CCXs, so one core over here in one CCX, a core over here in another CCX, there's about a 100 nanosecond uh, latency penalty when talking between CCXs. And that takes the total time to around 140 nanoseconds opposed to 40 nanoseconds within the same CCX, as I just said. It is believed that this added latency is why Ryzen isn't as impressive for gaming as you might expect it to be based on productivity performance. And the reason why AMD has gone with this modular design is, well, for the simple fact that it is just that modular. The design has allowed AMD's new Zen-based Naples server chips to pack up to 32 physical cores per chip using multiple CCX modules. So essentially Ryzen is a server chip that's been scaled down for desktop computing. I should note that as Intel scales up the amount of cores their Xeon CPUs contain, they also use a modular design, though it only splits the CPU into two. Their method is called cluster on die, or COD for short, and this is ideal for highly NUMA optimized workloads. But again, we won't go into detail about this here. Getting back to the matter at hand, let's talk about the upcoming Ryzen 5 models. These 6-core and 4-core CPUs are based on the same physical chip as Ryzen 7. So this means all models feature two CCXs, each with 4 cores, though not all of them will be enabled. Basically, this means Ryzen 7 CPUs that feature one or more defective cores will be binned as Ryzen 5 parts. The 6-core models feature one core disabled per CCX, while the quad-core parts feature two cores disabled per CCX. The news that the quad-core Ryzen 5 parts would still utilise two CCX units disappointed quite a few people as they were hoping that the four-core models would be better for gaming as they wouldn't suffer the latency penalty when working between CCX units. With just two cores per CCX, the latency penalty will be amplified as it's far more likely crosstalk will occur with fewer cores. That being the case, a shipload of you have asked me to test the Ryzen 7 processors in a 2 plus 2 configuration and then compare it with a 4 plus 0 configuration. That is to say, emulating the Ryzen 5 quad cores with two cores per CCX and then testing them again with four cores in a single CCX with the second CCX completely disabled. 
The idea being that the ladder configuration won't suffer CCX crosstalk latency, as all four cores will be working within the same CCX. Uh, in theory, this means games should run better, uh, but we'll have to go find out. So for testing, we have six games in total, all of which were tested at 1080p using the Titan XP to try and remove any kind of GPU bottleneck. So let's go and check out the results. First up, we have F1 2016. And here we see running a single CCX for the four plus zero configuration. Performance is much the same as the two plus two configuration. Still, this game provided a strong result for AMD as the quad core Ryzen 5 part clocked at four gigahertz, a slightly faster than the 7600K clocked at 4.8 gigahertz. As we have seen in previous tests, Far Cry Primal is a game that Ryzen really struggles with. Evidently though, the performance issues aren't caused by the CCX latency, as running all four cores within a single CCX did not improve performance in this title. This test was a bit pointless, but I included it anyway since we already had the 2 plus 2 results from last week's video. As you can see, the Titan XP is maxed out in For Honor using either configuration on the Ryzen processor. Ghost Recon Wildlands is another GPU intensive game, and here we see much the same performance using either the standard 2 plus 2 configuration or the 4 plus 0 configuration. Mafia 3 is a title where I suspected removing the CCX latency might help improve performance further, but I was wrong, we see no real difference here. Testing with Battlefield 1 shows very minor performance improvements when using a single CCX. Here the 4 plus 0 configuration allowed for 3% more performance. Not exactly a huge increase, but with roughly the same boost to the minimum and average frame rates, it seems like removing the CCX cross torque here does lead to slightly better performance. Interestingly though, if we look at the 1% and 0.1% frame time performance in Battlefield 1, the 4 plus 0 and 2 plus 2 configurations deliver the same results. So it's really starting to look like the increased latency incurred with cross torque between the CCXs doesn't really impact gaming performance, at least in the games we tested. The horrible Far Cry Primal performance, for example, certainly isn't CCX related. Now, you might be wondering, how do I actually know if the BIOS was configuring the Ryzen CPU as it claimed? When set to the 4 plus 0, for example, how do I know it wasn't just still in a 2 plus 2 configuration? Well, the easiest way to determine this is by measuring the level 3 cache performance. Here we are looking at the cache latency, and as expected, the level 1 and level 2 cache performance remains much the same regardless of the configuration, as this isn't shared cache. In other words, each core has its own dedicated level 1 and level 2 cache. The level 3 on the other hand, which is split into 8 megabyte chunks of shared cache per CCX, will be impacted by the core configuration as we can see here. Keeping all four cores in the same CCX, we only have an 8 megabyte level 3 cache, but it's all under the same roof, so it doesn't incur a latency penalty. With both CCX modules enabled, we now have 16 megabytes of level 3 cache, but of course it's spread across both CCXs, and this increases latency. Looking at the level 3 cache bandwidth, we see that the 2 plus 2 configuration heavily cripples write performance, reducing throughput from 210 gigabytes per second to just 91 gigabytes per second. The read throughput also takes a hit dipping from 211 gigabytes per second to 168 gigabytes per second. So we know for a fact that the down core feature is working and configuring the CPU as claimed. Before wrapping things up, here is a look at the Battlefield 1 benchmark running in either configuration. As you can see, performance is much the same. This is a custom Fraps pass, so the benchmark isn't identical, but it's very close. We of course report on the average minimum and average frame rate from three runs. Finally, I also took a look at Mass Effect Andromeda before wrapping things up, and again, this is another Fraps pass measuring in-game performance. As such, the benchmark runs, while very similar, aren't identical. For the most part, the 4 plus 0 configuration looks much faster, but having run the 60 second test three times on average, uh, it was just a single frame faster at 115 FPS to 114 FPS. The minimum frame rate was also just a single frame faster for the 4 plus 0 configuration. 
Well, initially we were concerned with AMD's decision to spread the Ryzen 5 quad-core CPUs across two CCXs, rather than keep them in a single module. And this was because we were aware of the latency penalty when communicating between CCX modules, and we believed as a more you know, gaming-orientated CPU, it would be imperative that AMD avoided this delay in communication. As it turns out, at least based on the testing done here, that for the most part, CCX crosstalk won't have a noticeable impact on gaming performance. So the fact that AMD has decided to arrange the Ryzen 5 quad-core processors in a 2 plus 2 configuration won't be disastrous for gaming. So with CCX crosstalk latency not looking to be the problem, the main culprit now appears to be memory bandwidth. Evidence has surfaced recently suggesting that when using DDR4-3600 memory, for example, Ryzen's gaming performance improves dramatically. Because of this, a few viewers have suggested I retest using DDR4-3600 memory to show what Ryzen is truly capable of. Sounds good, and I certainly don't disagree. More testing needs to be done. That said, once I manage to get one of my Ryzen systems working with DDR speeds above above 3200, I will certainly retest. Right now though, even getting DDR4-3000 to work is a real chore, and I've seen countless user reports from new Ryzen owners struggling to get DDR4-2666 working. So while the testing with DDR4-3600 memory might be a good indicator of Ryzen's untapped or at least future performance, it's far from representative of the kind of performance most consumers are going to see. In its current condition, I feel like most Ryzen owners will be using DDR4-2666 memory. The fact that you need to play around with base clock overclocking to exceed DDR4-3000 doesn't really make it a viable option at this point. For now, I really just wanted to get this video out of the way, especially as Ryzen 5 approaches. For the most part, we saw next to no difference spreading the cores across two CCX modules or keeping them under one roof in a single CCX. Battlefield 1 was really the only game that showed a slight performance advantage when sticking to a single CCX, but yeah, 3% gain using an extreme GPU at 1080p isn't exactly noteworthy stuff. Well, that's all for this one, guys. I hope you enjoyed the testing, and I bet a few of you were quite surprised by the findings. I know I was anyway. I'm your host, Steve. Catch you again soon.